So welcome to the final lecture of this series. And um, today I would like to point out where the subject is taken or was actually taken 100 years ago. Um, because when quantum mechanics proper was born by Schrodinger and, and Dirac and Heisenberg and so on, there was already the first revolution in physics of that century already had taken place, namely relativity. And um, so what we will do today, uh, we'll look at quantum mechanics in a relativistic context. And uh, that is a huge subject, but in fact, um, it could be that only small modifications to the existing formalism and equations would be necessary. You add an extra term, that extra term takes care of the relativistic effects. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. Quantum, uh, um, relativistic quantum mechanics, it turns out, will be crucially different from non-relativistic quantum mechanics. And today we'll discover also in a technical sense why. And um, so if we follow that route, we first come to the Klein-Gordon equation, the May Dirac equation, and so on. That's all peanuts. But then one realizes that these equations, so if you make the Schrodinger equation relativistic, this equation is no longer, no longer has a probability interpretation. So you know, one thing is to have the dynamical equation that carries the solution or the, the state forward. And, uh, but the other thing is you must be able to interpret that physically. And that miserably fails. And in the beginning, this was quite a puzzle, but of course, uh, we can pinpoint exactly where it fails and why it must fail. And there is no relativistic quantum mechanics in the type of the Schrodinger equation, even with modifications. The so-called Klein-Gordon equation and the Dirac equation, they are not solid quantum mechanical equations. One is forced to go to quantum field theory. So this is where the whole subject is going. Now, um, let's, however, review a little. Um, so let's say start first with um, heuristic deviation. of the Schrodinger equation. So we go back to something we actually cast into an axiom. Remember, axiom four was essentially the Schrodinger equation expressed in terms of, the, um, of a state, rho. Now, it's easy to write down an axiom, but the question is, how do you get there? And the thinking goes as follows. So Schrodinger recognized now, one can think about why that is true, but uh, we're not going to into that. Uh, Schrodinger recognized that replacing the energy, wherever it appears, by, my, uh, by plus i h bar d by dt, sorry, I should say replaced by, and replacing the momentum in the eighth direction, so say in a three-dimensional space, A is one, two, three, replacing this by minus IH bar in the direction of the eighth component. This is the, the T component of a, of a wave function family. That replacing E by that and P by that, where? In the energy-momentum relation, Well, the energy momentum relation of non relativistic mechanics, of non relativistic mechanics. And what is that? Well, you know, this is uh, the total energy E is the kinetic energy, so that's P squared divided by 2m plus the potential energy. And making thereby a differential equation or differential operator yields the Schrodinger equation. So you do that on the left hand side, you get I h bar d by dt. Well, it needs to act on something, so you write a psi. And the right hand side, you replace the p that yields a minus h bar squared by 2m, and then you have the Laplacian here psi plus v of x acting on psi, and you know this is the Schrodinger equation. And uh, we talked about these Schrodinger operators and so on. 
So that is how you can motivate this. Of course, you have to think about this here. Well, this year the p's go to this and the q's are multiplication. That's the stone for Neumann theorem. And um, well, this is the extension, so you get the Schrodinger equation. Now, uh, for whatever reason he did that, now assume somebody suggests this equation and says, well, I want complex representations of that. Something like this, okay. Um, how would you interpret this? And now, of course, again, you can invoke another axiom, our axiom 5, and say, well, uh, the interpretation is fixed to be such that this is a different row. This is not our state row. This is a probability density row. You just take the absolute value squared of this field. You then get a real field. So the result would be something from R3 to R, and notably to R0 plus, because the absolute value squared at every point x is, of course, a non-negative real number. And you say, I interpret this as a probability density, in this case, for a particle to be at the point x. Well, you know, that makes not much sense. You have to make little integrals over little regions, and then you get a finite probability. There's only probability density. Well, one can say something like this, but the question is, how on earth do you get the idea? How on earth? And um, so when this equation is there, um, so question, how does one get this idea to interpret rho as such? Well, if you want to interpret it as a probability density, you actually need two things. First of all, you must know that it's never less than zero. That's for sure. Uh, well, this would be true by construction. But so there's nothing else to be said. But there's another problem. If you integrate this row over all of R3, it better be 1. So OK, I can always arrange for that. Yes. But that's kind of a static thing. Now imagine you let the time run. You investigate how this changes if you look at this at different points in time. Then this integral better do not change. You better keep one, because otherwise you lose probability. That makes not much sense, right? So the axiom can be there as it is, but you need to ensure this, or it needs to be insured already. Otherwise, the axiom is a nice axiom, but it makes zero sense. So what do you study? Well, you take the equation as it stands, and you investigate its properties, and it takes two lines to see that everything is well. So let's do that. And the reason why I do that is because in a second we'll go to the relativistic version of it and we'll see nothing is well and nothing can be repaired. Not in, in a conservative sense. So obviously thinking about the time evolution of that equation you have to study this equation because the left-hand side is the change in the psi, the right-hand side doesn't depend on the well, doesn't depend on the change in t. So what we do, we consider the Schrödinger equation and its complex conjugate. So we write down i h bar d by dt psi equals minus h bar squared by 2m Laplace plus V, well, we let it act on the psi. And I consider at the same time its complex conjugate. Well, there is no extra information in it. It's the same equation. Put a bar here, here is minus h bar squared by 2m the plus psi bar. The bar, of course, pulls in plus v psi bar. It's twice the same equation. Um, now, what I do. On the right-hand side of the first one, I multiply by the complex conjugate of the field. So um, I write beyond this. I add or I multiply with a psi bar. Here I multiply by a psi bar. And here I put a psi bar. 
And in the other equation, I multiply from the left, it doesn't matter, but I multiply from the left by a psi. There's a minus, a psi, a psi, a psi. Okay? It's still only the Schrodinger equation, very simple uh, conclusions from it. Um, note that from the Schrodinger equation, this follows, but not the other way around, because at some points the psi could vanish, not everywhere. So, but anyway, that's, that's a, a conclusion. And now what I do, I calculate uh, 1 minus 2. Could be easier, could it? Okay, what do we get? We get I H bar brackets del T psi times psi bar plus, uh -huh, plus I H bar is already out, psi del T psi bar. Close bracket, that's the left hand side. And on the right hand side, I get um, okay, let me first, minus h bar squared by 2m, um, you have a plus here, no, you have a, you have a minus, anything wrong? Or? No, minus, so now you subtract this from that, there's a minus out, so, okay, you get Laplace psi, psi bar, minus psi Laplace psi bar, so note here you have a plus, but there you get a relative minus sign, but now this and that is the same thing, so it ends, so the potential doesn't play any role, it's important. So now we rewrite this a little, first of all we kill an h bar, that's easy, kill the h bar, and um, now here we can also rewrite this guy um, as a double application of a nabla if we put a momentum in there. But um, what I want to claim is the following. I want to claim this equation must be something like, um, well, okay, let's, uh, let's write this out first. So here on the right-hand side, I pull the h in, so I get a minus 1 over 2m, but I can pull the minus in as well. It doesn't matter, what do I want? Well, it's so much doesn't matter. So I, I leave the minus out, but I write this thing as a del A acting on a minus I H bar. So this is where the other H bar goes. Um, del down A on the psi uh, acting on the psi bar. So now I have uh, one minus too much, so I get rid of that. Uh, but then there is an i too much, I need to modify this, so I get a minus i. That's this. Minus, now I do the psi here, and then comes the del a minus i h bar. Aha, hang on, I put this out again, okay. So I guess this yields a plus here, is that right? No, I got myself confused, I'm sorry. <sighs> so this is right, okay, so now I go to this one. I have a minus h bar by 2m in front. I write here minus del a minus i h bar del a psi bar. Okay, but if I did that, I got rid of the h bar, that's right. Um, I pulled the minus in, I think that was that move. And then I have the i there that compensates for that. I think that, that must be, that must be it. In any case, what the claim is, this is just to see more easily what the claim is. If you define rho to be psi bar times psi, and you define a vector field, covector field, it was messed up with the indices here, but that's because we don't write the metric explicitly, 
so you write this as um, Aha. Uh -huh. Del A psi times psi bar minus psi del A psi bar. Something like that. So now the I in front cancels. Uh huh. Okay. This is a little, little messed up. So maybe there's, there's, there's an overall I somewhere. If you write this current, then you can bring this to the form. So have some factor in front here, alpha. You can bring this to the form that the d by dt rho plus the gradient of this vector field of this current equals zero. Right? So this guy here, is that guy over here. And uh, so the only thing one has to get straight is the eyes there. Uh, I think there is an... So if you, we kill this eye against that eye, so this line no longer is valid, this eye against that eye, you have a minus sign there. Then you get a relative minus sign in here if you want. So you can pull it in here and there something of the sort, then it would be rather the other way around here, and uh, you might have an overall I here. Something like that. You, you figure it out. Okay, this is now... So you get this continuity equation. What does that mean? Well, it looks rather artificial. We identified this guy here, which you get from here, because it's kind of like by the product rule, this works like that. But this thing on the right-hand side looks extremely artificial, right? I mean, why, why do you write this down? Well, the point is it doesn't matter what this expression is. What you wanted to learn about is about the change in time of the row, which you want to interpret as your energy density, uh, your, your probability density. So it actually doesn't matter what exactly here is, as long as it can be written in the form down there. And that's already clear in this line, that you can pull this guy out, and then there is something here. So therefore, this means that if you take the integral over all of space and you exchange it with the derivative, rho over all of space, what is that? That's the integral over all of space of the del A of something, of J A. But if you go over all of space, if this is over R3, then there is no surface term, and this here is a pure surface term. So the result is zero, right? Aha! So that means the integrated so the total probability does not change in time. Perfect. And this is not a trivial result because our definition here only depends the psi as it depends on the spatial position x. This has nothing to do with time. You know that you have a spatial probability density. The Schrodinger equation evolves it further. Ten seconds later, it looks like this and that. So the question of whether this is positive, well, that is at, true at any time. is by definition because the absolute value is squared. But the question of whether the total probability is conserved, that's a question that has dynamical content. You need to look at the evolution equation for that. So in fact, so the upshot of this is the axioms 4 and 5. Um, are consistent with the probability uh, with the well they are consistent because five tells you how to interpret the whole thing okay so everything is well you can interpret the Schrodinger equation according to this um, 
probabilistic interpretation, and you see it's this quadratic thing, so this makes all the funny, the funny effects, right? The, the Schrodinger equation itself, forget about the blue psi bar, is a linear PDE, this is particularly simple. Lots of the quantum mechanics special stuff comes in by interpreting the result this way. Okay, good, so that's it. Now, in fact, so second, heuristic derivation of a relativistic quantum mechanics. In fact, when Schrodinger thought about this stuff, he did not write down the Schrodinger equation because he thought, why would I bother with the non-relativistic energy momentum um, relation because he already knew it was the energy momentum relation of special relativity he wanted to implement. So in fact, the equation we're not now going to derive is the so-called Klein-Gordon, well derive, right, motivate, is the Klein-Gordon equation and it should be better called the Schrodinger equation because Schrodinger found it first. But then he discovered a serious problem with it and that's why he abandoned it and he went to the non-relativistic case where the problem was not present. Okay, so heuristic deviation is this. So we recall that in, uh, what is Newtonian physics, what is non-relativistic physics? Mechanics. Well, so what we already used, non-relativistic mechanics is you consider space-time, but Newtonian space-time, uh, which is a flat, uh, which is a smooth manifold, and then there's a special thing. There's something called an absolute time. And mathematically speaking, this absolute time is a smooth function on the manifold that has nowhere vanishing gradient dt. That's an absolute time. So if Newton talks about an absolute time that is ticking and blub, 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 he means that. He means to say that. He doesn't have the mathematics to say it unambiguously. But that's what he means. And then Newtonian space-time is not equipped with a metric. Newtonian space-time is equipped with a so-called connection. You cannot equip it with a metric. It makes no sense. But there's a connection. That's the connection when Newton says a particle moving under the influence of no forces or saying a non-charged particle, particle to which forces, uh, which forces can't, can't move, moves along a straight line. You, this first axiom defines what a straight line is, and actually this here is the so-called parallel transport, and that defines geometrically what a straight line is. So this is a torsion-free connection. And uh, then Newton talks about that time flows uniformly, and that hardly means at the speed of one second per second. What he means by that is that, well, he means it, but he... I, I think Newton means a lot of this. You, you can read this, um, but, but again, he doesn't have the, the mathematics to say it clearly. Uh, time flows uniformly means this. Okay, anyway, that's Newtonian space-time, and uh, if you use this here, you can find a stratified atlas such that a picture of Newtonian space-time is like this. Uh, you have all your equal time surfaces. There are there is such a thing as equal time surfaces because you have this uh, absolute time and you have like a lot of R3 photographs for each point in time. That's the picture of Newtonian space-time. And that's just what it is, okay? And also, so space-time is very often associated to non-relativist, uh, to relativistic physics, but that makes zero sense because it's just the right data structure to talk about what happens where and when the so so-called events. Now, relativistic space-time is distinctly different and, uh, well, in principle you would have to be a madman to change this picture because it makes so much sense, right? When happens what? And the point is Einstein, contrary to how it's sometimes presented, didn't think about space and time because he was so ingenious. He thought about space and time because he had to. Because even within this picture, Maxwell formulated his Maxwell equations, which came out of observations of the Faraday and the Ampere law. And if the Maxwell equations are right, that forces us to a different picture. 
Maxwell theory, if right, forces one to a dramatically different picture or different theory of space-time. And that's, of course, the relativistic space-time of Einstein. What is relativistic space-time? Well, you also know from the previous mechanics course from the last few lectures, relativistic space-time is also a smooth manifold of dimension four. But instead of the time, the ab having absolute time and the connection, there is one single structure replacing the two, and that is a so-called Lorentzian metric. Lorentzian metric, and Lorentzian refers to uh, its signature. So it has a signature plus, minus, 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 for instance. could also be minus, plus, plus, plus. Anyway, one sign like this, the other is differently. And that, and there's one more ingredient, however, it's the G that replaces both structures. And from this G, you can actually derive a connection on space-time. But it's a very special one. It's one that's torsion-free and compatible with this G. And now the picture is dramatically different because at every point of space-time, you have in the tangent space. So don't inter over-interpret this picture. This is a little cone in each tangent space and the tangent space attached to here. You have at every point in space-time, well, first of all, you have a double cone because you have a metric, right? Um, so it can look rather wild. It's the Einstein field equation that governs how these look depending on the matter content. You can have a very, not very, but you can have a boring situation where they all, where there is a coordinate system that they all appear like this. But really, this is always at this point in this tangent space, at this point in this tangent space, and so on. And there is an extra structure here that we call capital T, which has absolutely or very little or nothing to do with this T. This capital T is a nowhere vanishing time-like vector field that just can be used to select one of the halves. And then you have something like this. And that is the space-time structure, right? There's not one big cone like here or several big cones. At every point, there is a little cone. That's the space-time structure. OK. Yes? Um, so uh, would you say that the T is then also derived from the G, or do you don't just No, the T is extra. The T is extra. The T is the big... No, the little T. The little T. The little t is no, there is no little T. The, the little T is gone. Little T is in this structure. If you... Um, took this to an extreme, you could put a zero here and the cones would open more and more and more and it would look like this somehow. But this limit makes no more sense because in the limit this would no longer be a non-degenerate metric if there's a zero up here and then the whole construction breaks down. So it's very difficult from this, or subtle, from this picture to get this as the limit case. Mm -hmm. There are very quick arguments, they look very good until you start pushing them. Okay, no, so it's really uh, that the absolute time and the connection melt into one structure, which is the Lorentzian space time metric. That is just the way it is. Okay, um, and this T here is the, the dirty secret of relativity theory because in relativity we talk about time, and here you can say what is forward in time and backward in time. Well, a vector, so that if you have a world line that runs in space time, so it's the history of some particle, histories look like little curves in space time, right? That's the beauty of this data structure that everything that ever happened to the particle is in there. So you play God, you look at this, and you, you know what's, what's happening. Now, the question is, you can have a curve running like this, or you can have a ru curve running in the opposite direction. Now, also here, you have a definition. The curve, in order to be the history of a particle, must run forward. But what do you mean by forward? Well, it means that the tangent vector of the curve is everywhere if you apply the dt, the gradient of the uh, absolute time to it, must be greater than zero. This is the time orientation is also in this absolute time function. Whereas here in, in a Lorentzian manifold, there is no such thing. 
you cannot distinguish, if you only look at the metric, you cannot distinguish this part of the tone from this part. Well, you have both parts, but you cannot say one is, prefer uh, is preferred over the other. You need an extra nowhere vanishing time-like vector field. If it's nowhere vanishing uh, then, and it's smooth, uh, then it will consistently select one of the two cones by lying in it rather than in the other one. So the problem of time, not the problem of time, the, the problem of direction of time, what is the future and what is the past, is brutally put on top of the space-time structure. Right? There are lots of thoughts you can have from thermodynamics, what's the, the direction of the time arrow, right? in which direction does it run. In relativity, this question is not resolved, it's brutally solved by saying, let's have an extra structure that says how it is. Okay, good. You need this because otherwise if you have the cones conspiring like this, say, oops, uh, like this, say, um, and out here they're like this, and in there they're like that, then you have a black hole. Because here, so th particles can only run forward, right? And if they're massive, they must run inside the cone, and if they're massless, uh, they must run on the boundary of the cone, okay? You can only go in, you cannot go out. If you had the double cone, well, you could go in, but why couldn't you go out? You could, right? You need the time orientation to make the black holes black. Good. Anyway, that's this structure. And you see, we discussed the Schrodinger equation for almost the entire duration of the course. We said an element of a Hilbert space is a function on such a time slice. And then at a later point, you have a different function which corresponds to a different time slice. But the objects always depend on the spatial coordinates you chose, not sp on, on the spatial section you chose here. Okay? Now here, what on earth, how on earth would that look like? Well, the truth is you also choose spatial sections. So you choose sections that always lie here in the spatial part, so it looks a little like this, but you have many ways to choose them. Okay? It's very complicated. And um, but at the end of the day, what you need, you will still, even in relativity, like in the, in the non-relativistic case, your wave function, so to speak, will only depend on spatial coordinates. But you can choose in a certain way, you can choose which ones, okay? But the point is the time evolution is the one that will have to respect either such a slicing of space-time or such a picture. Okay, I can't go into details, but the, this is to be encoded in the dynamical equation. So if we want to find a relativistic version of the Schrodinger equation, we have to transfer what we did in section one, which kind of has to do with this picture, we have to transfer it to such a picture. Okay, now um, being a courageous physicist at the beginning of the 20th century, you just said, well, I had a prescription for doing that in non-relativistic physics. Let's try precisely the same prescription. I mean, it's magic. It has nothing to do with logical argument. It's just magic. Let's try the same prescription, but let's start not from the non-relativistic energy-momentum relation. Let's simply plug it into the relativistic one. I mean, all possible things could be wrong with that, okay? So this is... Uh, so if you're a student and you come up with such an idea, nobody had it before, and you go to your supervisor, he will say, well, you're quite naive. But in fact, you would also be quite right, because it turns out that's precisely the way it goes. So um, Schrodinger, quite courageously, um, tried. So. What's the relativistic dispersion relation? It's not E equals P squared by 2M plus V. Uh, it's E squared equals P squared plus M squared. So um, one has to interpret this right. And uh, this is certain if you set the speed of light to 1. Let's do that. It looks like that. That's the relativistic energy 
uh, momentum relation. If you have zero momentum, this is e squared equals m squared. Well, because c is one, there's a c here, okay? And then you, you know, there's a c squared here. No, no, there's a c to the fourth, right? Um, you take the square root, this is e equals mc squared. If you have zero momentum, that's the rest energy, okay? So this is the, um, the energy momentum, the relativistic energy momentum relation. And rather than plugging in his little scheme of letting uh, e go to i h bar dt and letting the momenta go to minus i h bar del a, rather than plugging this into the non-relativistic one, he plugs it into here. And what does he get? He gets minus h bar squared d by dt squared equals right hand side minus h bar squared del a um, plus, well, that's just multiplication, ma, and well, just to distinguish, but it, a priori it means nothing different, he puts a field phi there. So now I'm a little puzzled, and that probably has to do with my choice of, no, it's perfect, thank you. Okay, so, um, <laughs> I multiply the whole thing by minus one, and I do this, and I bring this to the form. I factor out, and for simplicity, I set h bar to one, two. It's just to see the gist of it, not to have all this clutter, okay? You get d by dt twice, minus, you take this to the other side, d by dA, each of them twice, uh, d by dA, dA phi, let's say something like this, minus, nay, plus, perfect, plus m squared phi equals zero. And then you see, well, this is the D'Alembertian, no, this is the Laplacian, and if you take, if you take this whole operator here, you can call it box phi. So it's like the second time derivative, but then minus the second derivative in the first direction, minus the second derivative in the second direction, and so on. And you have the so-called Klein-Gordon equation, first found by Schrödinger. Box plus m squared on phi equals zero. So it's the free Klein-Gordon equation because it has no interaction term. Uh -huh. Now, obviously, you do a derivation like this, and you say, okay, hang on, uh, you took this energy momentum relation that applies in such a situation, but does this really take care of everything it has to? So the phi depends on the x's and on the t, um, but now this operator directly x and that on the t also the second time derivative. You see, the difference is in the Schrodinger equation, this was a first time derivative, here this is a second one. One can think about you cannot have something that respects this structure without having the spatial and the time-like derivative, very strange wording, but let's say it like this for, for the sake of simplicity, having them on a similar footing. It's not on the same footing. On the same footing, you would need a plus here. Then they would be indistinguishable. They're not on the same footing. They're on a similar footing because it's not the same to be outside the cone and inside the cone. The outside of a cone is not a convex cone, right? Think of all of space and you take the, the complement of this. This doesn't look like this. Like the, no? So they're on a similar footing. The minus sign is tremendously important, okay? The minus sign ultimately comes from the Maxwell equations. Okay, if you have a plus there, it would all be very different. Uh, there would not be physics in the first place. If you, have a, if you have relativistically a plus here, you cannot say I have initial data and the equations evolve them to further data at a later point, which is the business of physics to predict the future. Uh, if you have relativistic physics that should predict the future, there must be a minus sign here. So anyway, so at first sight, this looks not very different. I mean, you could even have the mass to zero. You think it's not so different to the Schrodinger equation. There's just a second time derivative here. But this second time derivative makes all the trouble here. Well, let me first say a proper analysis of how you come to this equation would actually require a study 
of the representations of the symmetry group here, and that's the Poincaré group. By similar reasoning, you could go to the Schrödinger equation, it's only that then you would have to take the representations of the Galilei group, right? It's a non-relativistic symmetry group. The representation theory of the Galilei group is much more complicated than the already somewhat complicated representation theory of the Poincaré group, which uh, is the relativistic equivalent of it. Anyway, uh, a proper analysis actually done by Wigner, uh, and I think he was an assistant professor in Princeton at the time, he did that, and that influenced particle physics throughout the entire 20th century, and in Princeton they said it's not good enough for tenure, so they didn't give him the professorship because it was just this group theory nonsense, but that actually inf influenced the whole 20th century particle physics. Anyway, so um, Wigner did this, and when he did it, Einstein wrote him a letter before and he said, you've got to be very, very careful in doing this representation theory, and he answered, yes, I will be. And um, so not this kind of magic, this witch mathematics and physics, but rather proper arguments lead you to precisely the same equation. Okay, so this is an outlook, so I'm not developing that. You need several lectures to do that. Um, but this can also be seen like that. It's just we don't know it's right. Well, you trust me, it is right. So we now have this equation. So Schrödinger was very happy with that. And uh, because in a non-relativistic case, it also worked. I told you he first tried this, then he tried the other thing and so on. But now the question is, can we give this phi Again, a probability amplitude interpretation. So is there some way, some way to find an expression in terms of phi that can be interpreted as a probability amplitude? And um, the answer is no, you cannot. And it has to do, no, the, the whole reason is the second time derivative here. There are actually two issues with this equation. In any other relativistic equation, there's also a refinement of this one, which is called the Dirac equation. I'll write it down in the end. So you all see that's the equation of a relativistic electron. Uh, Maxwell's equations are already relativistic. Well, that's where the whole thing started. But none of them can be given, none of the fields appear, appearing in there can be given a probability interpretation. And this is pretty bad. Because it means you have a relativistic equation, but you don't know how to interpret the solutions. Well, obviously, that cannot be the solution, right? That cannot be non-relativistic. That cannot be relativistic quantum mechanics. Well, let me first show you what the, what the issue is. And of course, we today know what to do. But it's a deviation from quantum mechanics. It becomes a subject known as quantum field theory. And the whole standard model of particle physics today is formulated as a quantum field theory. Okay, so uh, what's the issue here? Well, um, try to identify, to identify a quantity rho, so analogous to before, um, such that, such that a, the integral over spatial slices over this row is constant in time. Yeah. Constant in time. You need that, right? Um, constant one. And B, um, that row is everywhere non-negative because otherwise it's not a good probability density. If it becomes negative, we have a serious problem. Now, let's try, because we need both anyway, let's try to look at number A. Number A, well, will be satisfied. A will be satisfied if we find, a, now we call it a capital J mu, right, such that del mu capital J mu is zero. Well, now the del the mu runs from zero, one, two, three. Well, I can split this exactly as before. I can say this is a derivative in the zero direction, let's say a derivative in time of the J zero component plus a derivative in the alpha direction, well, eighth direction, sorry. A runs from one, two, three uh, of the three components here. 
you see this is just another way this is just another way to split this because it's just a summation convention here right so if we find such a j mu we need that in order to satisfy a uh, now observe we do precisely what we did before. We take the Schrodinger, uh, the Klein-Gordon equation, box phi plus m squared phi equals zero, and we multiply it from the right by a phi bar. And we take the complex conjugate of that equation, box phi bar plus m squared phi bar equals zero, and we multiply it by phi from the right. Now we subtract the second from the first. What do we get? Well, on the left-hand side, we get box phi times phi bar minus phi box phi bar. And on the right-hand side, we get zero because the m terms don't see each other. So you look at this guy. You see there are no annoying eyes in here. That's the... Uh, that's why I got a little confused before, but you can easily insert factors, right? I mean, it's not use waste, wasting time on that here. Um, so you look at this guy, and you note that if you introduce the following J mu, mu running from 0 to 3, Thus, j mu del mu equals zero, as we needed to satisfy a, if the j mu is something of the sort uh, del mu phi times phi bar minus phi del mu phi bar. Because if we act on this with the del mu, we get twice the product rule but in each of those, one term cancels against another one, and the two terms that remain are these two terms. Okay? So we see, if we want to split this in a term of a continuity equation, in order to now have this one here guaranteed by, what is it, the Gauss theorem, right? the surface term vanishing, then we need to conclude that the row that we need is phi bar del 0 phi minus phi del 0 phi bar, because the row needs to be the j0. So this is our candidate, and it's our only candidate, for the probability amplitude. And in fact, that looks extremely the same, like in the Schrodinger case, right? That we also had a psi bar, dt psi, and so on. So you say, yeah, 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 it's all similar. The massive difference, what's the massive difference? The massive difference, difference to non-relativistic case is that the Schrodinger equation was of the first order in dt, and this equation is of the second order in dt. I emphasized that before. You remember? What's the difference? Well, the difference is if something is of the first order in dt, what can you prescribe as initial conditions? Well, you can only prescribe the field itself at a certain point in time, say the point in time zero. If an equation is of the second derivative order, you can prescribe as initial conditions concerning t, you can prescribe the field and its derivative in t. Is that right? Always one derivative less you can prescribe than the equation has. So that means in this case you can prescribe this value and that value at will. You can prescribe them at will you can arrange for, thus one can 
arrange for this row to be negative on some counts. Not all the time, but at certain points in time. For instance, when you start. Well, this is the big problem. Do you now see why I said it's the second derivative dependence on t that causes the problem? Because it allows you to make such choices. The formula looks the same, but now you can make more choices in initial conditions. And if you can choose this as initial conditions, you could also choose different initial conditions, and your dynamics might evolve you there. Aha. Uh -huh. So what does that mean? Well, it means it can only be this row, because otherwise you don't have this preservation, this conservation of probability. But it's conservation of anything, but not of probability density, because it can get negative. This is a problem that cannot be repaired. It cannot be repaired anywhere at this level. So the Dirac, OK, so that's, that's, the, that's the problem. So it means you have a relativistic version of the Schrodinger equation. This looks all very good. It's co well, covariant, as they say. It, it works with the space temperature. As a classical equation, it works perfectly well. But if you try to start uh, interpreting this as a probability density or any construction, it needs to be this construction, you, you, you go wrong. It doesn't work. Okay. Now, um, so there's a problem. And this problem then extends. And Dirac recognized that the problem has to do with the second time derivative. And so Dirac, by trying to solve this problem, which he didn't solve that way, discovered another equation which nevertheless plays an important role. Okay, so history is sometimes like this. He tried to solve one thing. In fact, he solved another. Yes? Um, why can't you just put it on top as an axiom and just say a row has to be bigger than zero, though? Why is it possible? Yes, let, let me explain what Dirac tried to do uh, very briefly. And Dirac invented a, an idea, the so-called sea of electrons. Have you heard of that, the Dirac sea? He invented that in order, in the Dirac equation, to to kind of get around this problem by some extra assumptions. Um, it's really not a good construction, but, but anyway. So let's um, go third Dirac equation. So Dirac then said, OK, it is the second derivative. So his insight, which is correct, second time derivative causes the trouble as we now recovered here. So Dirac's thinking was like this. He says, OK, you have e squared equals p squared plus m squared. He says, I can't change that. Relativity is relativity. So he said, aha, the second time derivative comes by replacing the e but i h bar dt. But annoyingly, I have e squared here, right? So what do you do if you have e squared and you want e? Well, you take the square root. So Dirac says, ah, I get my first time derivative back, getting rid of this problem, if on the right-hand side I take the square root. Well, the problem with that, of course, is that that means you get minus h bar squared. Well, I now write this nabla operator thing, right? Blah, blah, blah squared plus m squared, and then the square root out of that. You can now start um, expanding this into a series, and you get higher and higher and higher derivatives. Is that clear? If you expand around m squared, you get higher and higher and higher derivatives. And that's a theory with infinite, of infinite spatial derivative order. Whew, that's also not particularly good. And Dirac said, aha, but maybe I can write the right-hand side also as a first derivative. And he invented something like the gamma matrices. Now, the gamma matrices already take both sides into account. So he, involved, he invoked actually alpha and beta matrices and so on. But uh, so following this thought, this thought, he came to the following equation. So this is dot, dot, dot. OK. Yeah, it takes one lecture to develop. It's not that bad. But finally, it comes to the equation i, 
gamma mu del mu, del mu, uh, the mu runs again from zero to three, that's the time derivative and the three spatial derivatives. There is a new object gamma mu that uh, goes in summation coordination with this, minus m on some funny new psi equals zero. And he said this equation should be such that still it implements this relativistic um, energy momentum relation. And in fact, you find that in order to do that, and then you can take this operator multiplied from the left in the conjugated manner, blah, 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 uh, you can get that if these gammas are not four numbers, but if these gammas, so the gamma zero to gamma four, if the gamma mu's are four by four matrices, so you have four, four by four matrices that satisfy the following condition that satisfy gamma mu, gamma nu. So that's the muth matrix, matrix multiplied with the nuth one plus the nuth one matrix multiplied with the muth one is two times eta mu nu. What's eta mu nu? Well, eta mu nu is what you call the Minkowski metric. Eta mu nu is a matrix, indices mu nu, with plus one, minus one, minus one, minus one. And this thing is called the Dirac algebra. And if this is a matrix, then uh, four by four matrix, then it makes only sense if you have also here a four by four matrix. It's the unit matrix multiplied by M. And this psi is a four component object on which the matrix acts by matrix multiplication as if it was a vector. But in fact, it's called a spinner, and that has to do with transformation properties under space-time transformations. I can't go into all of that, uh, but what we have here is the Dirac equation, and it gets a first time derivative. That's what Dirac wanted because he saw, saw the second one as a problem. He gets around the problem of the infinitely high spatial derivatives by having the ingenious idea uh, of actually uh, extending the field, which is a one component field, to a four component field, and then he gets around this restriction. I mean, come on, somebody writes down something like this to solve this problem, you say, okay, any other crazy idea on top maybe, right? It's not particularly plausible at, the first, at first sight. It becomes even less plausible if, when looking at this, you discover if there is matter, there must be antimatter with certain properties, okay? And that's described at the same time by this equation. You say, okay, anything more exotic? But then afterwards, antimatter was discovered, and the Dirac equation was a terrible success, and, and so on, and so on, and so on, okay? Um, so, I mean, these guys were also particularly lucky that it works that way, right? Today, we understand a little better why it works, but that's the Dirac equation. So now he has his first time derivative. The question is, is this problem solved? Do you have a good probability interpretation for the psi? No, you don't. The problem persists. So he did all of this, he discovered antimatter and had the, the uh, theory of the relativistic electron that to the present day is the theory of the relativistic electron, okay? In its extension to quantum field theory, we'll come to that, but he didn't solve that problem. So that means with the Dirac equation, you again make no reasonable predictions. However, here you can now think of a sea of Dirac electrons that are all already there and sometimes there is a hole where one kind of jumps up in this energy space and the hole then propagates itself, that's then the antimatter and so on. It's a very, I mean, it's a very, I, I don't know, pictorial solution to the whole thing and you can think and interpret that way and that somehow works. So sometimes the Dirac equation is discussed as, as one says in the subject, as a one particle equation. This is the wave function, you interpret in a certain way but you have to have these extra ideas of how the situation is, okay? And then it kind of takes care of the problem. However, we now see the problem of these negative probability densities, once you go to the relativistic case, is even stable under removing what the apparent problem is. So it, the problem is the second time derivative, but then if you get rid of that with arcane extra constructions, the problem somehow creeps somewhere else. So this is where you say there is something we're not understanding here. There's something that the problem resists. Well, a problem sometimes 
proves its worth in research by resisting your attempts to solve it. And so at that point, it's sometimes good to take a step back from the technicalities of all of this. I mean, you can read up on this, the one particle, Schrodinger and, uh, uh, and Klein Gordon and the Dirac equation, you, you'll find all kinds of stuff, okay? But now let's take a step back and think, is there a deeper reason? Is there a very simple reason what is wrong? Why can't I find an interpretation of this thing as the probability density for a particle to be somewhere? And actually the sentence for a particle to be somewhere, what turns out is the wrong thing is that you say for, uh, for one particle to be somewhere. There is no one particle interpretation because one particle is to have one particle, that is no longer a concept preserved under time. So fourth, the deep root of the problem. Well, everybody on the street knows the deep root of the problem. So the famous man on the street, what does he say when you say Einstein, you tell me? You say Einstein, the man on the street says? Yes? E equals mc squared. That's what the man on the street says, and he's right. And that's the problem. If I have a particle, or say you have two particles of a certain mass, and you shoot them together, and you do that with enough energy, whatever happens when you shoot them together, whatever the interaction is, there's absolutely no contradiction to four particles coming out. Well, somehow in different directions because of momentum conservation. But the point is particle number is not conserved. Particle number is no longer conserved. Of course not. If you have two particles and you pump enough energy into them, you have enough energy to create new masses. Because the ma you have not particles of any mass. They come in certain discrete uh, levels. We don't understand why deeply, uh, but they do. So if you shoot two electrons together at low energy, they will stay two electrons. But if you crush them together at very high energy, you can get 20 and photons and whatnot, different particles. That depends on the exact physics. But the particle number is no longer conserved. But this equation already carries that in it. So it certainly carries it in it if you then also take the p squared on top. If you, hmm? So that means what we were fundamentally mistaken about was to look for an equation in the relativistic context, context that describes one particle fully relativistically. Because out of one particle can become 20 and so on, energy-wise. So what you need, you need to allow for the possibility. So need to allow for zero particles, one particle, two particles, three particles, four particles, and so on, particles. at the same time, so to speak. So you need to have a thinking. It's like I have space, like R3, and I think the possibility that this chalk, although it's here, it could be over there. That's why we have axes that go in various directions, right? If you imagine space as R2, you have a problem because it can go up. You want to allow for it to go up. Well, in quantum mechanics, you want to allow for your system not only be in the one particle, state, so to speak, you want it to be able to jump from here to the two-particle state and then to the three-particle state. And also, you want to be able to think of no particles, the vacuum. How do you do that? Well, the idea, this lecture is only about ideas and telling a big story. This can be uh, written down in detail. The idea is that the one-particle sector you still, one particle sector, one calls this, you we already know how that works. We say, okay, quantum mechanics happens on the Hilbert space in a certain time slice. 
And what is two particles? Well, you know that two particles happen on the tensor product. Isn't that the case? And three particles, you have to alternatively look at the triple tensor product. Um, so if you want to look at one or two particles, you need to take the direct sum. You need to add these two vector spaces. That means, yeah, you attach one to the other. Then you add this one, and so you go on. And you also want to talk about no particles, and you just put a complex, the Hilbert space is just a complex line. You put that there. And this entire structure, which you call the Fox space F, inherits from this Hilbert space, has an inner product, right? This inner product we saw in the problems uh, actually induces an inner product on the tensor product, right? So if you know what the inner product is on your one particle Hilbert space, you already know what it is on the two particle Hilbert space, and so on. But then you can take the sum of these inner products, roughly speaking, and that way you get an inner product on the entire Fox space. What now? What? Sorry. No, not a problem. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We will. Okay. So. What is this? This is the kinematical structure that allows you to not think one particle, one particle, one particle, one particle, that allows you to think, ah, or two particles. Or by superposition, you could have an element of the Fox space which lies in here, plus an element that lies in here would still be an element here. You could have a superposition of having one particle and two particles at the same time. Well, as much as you can have a superposition otherwise within the Hilbert space, because it's a big Hilbert space that you get. But this is the kinematical structure of a multi-particle theory, but not of a fixed number multi-particle theory like we looked at so far, but one where you have a variable number. This Fox space, have you heard the word Fox space before? This Fox space here, the way this is constructed, this Fox space is the way to think about several copies of a one particle system. And what we tried so far is to write down the Klein-Gordon equation or to write down the Dirac equation as an equation that only, that acts on an element only of this one particle Hilbert space. And that failed. So the Klein-Gordon solution or Dirac solution interpreted with this inner product and whatever you choose, whatever inner product you choose, yields you negative norm states, so negative probability densities. This is nonsense, okay? That's what we discovered. It doesn't make sense. The solution is to, in a specific way, lift the equation acting on this object to an equation acting on an object that can be an element of the entire Fox space. First step. Second step, by miracle. Well, you can calculate it, okay? But now, for the sake of argument, by miracle. That, in, once you lift that in a certain way, to the entire Fox space, and then you calculate solutions, and you evaluate them with this Fox space in our product, the problem is gone. Only positive probability densities. That's the magic. But it makes sense. A relativistic quantum theory cannot deal with one particle. It cannot deal with 20 particles. It must deal with any number of particles, and depending on what happens, that changes. And it makes perfect sense that only once you take into account that the particle number can change, which, which corresponds to moving between the different sectors, if you wish, only then, on that entire space, do you find an inner product that has the desired properties. That's the solution. That's the solution to the thing. Now, there is a slight difference between the Klein-Gordon equation. The Klein-Gordon equation requires that you take here the symmetrized tensor products everywhere, and that's then called the bosonic Fox space, sometimes indicated like circle F. Now, the um, Dirac equation, if you try to, to lift it in the same way, it doesn't work. 
it starts working. No, it does work. Doesn't start. It's, it does work once you choose the wedge product, so the anti-symmetrized tensor product here, and then you get the so-called fermionic Fox space. Okay. So for the Dirac equation and for the Klein-Gordon equation, you have to choose different types of tensor products. In both cases, these are indistinguishable particles. You remember our discussion about the symmetric and the antisymmetric one? And uh, here you have fermions. The Dirac equation describes fermions. There is no way to consistently lift the Dirac equation to the entire Fox space such that this gives positive uh, um, probabilities. Um, unless you do the, the wedge product here, right? So if you look at the book like Peskin and Schroeder, quantum field theory, it actually says, well, let's quantize the Klein-Gordon equation. Everything goes fine with this Fox space picture. They don't say it so explicitly, unfortunately. But then they try it with the Dirac equation. It goes terribly wrong if you take the symmetrized tensor product. So the Dirac equation does, it describes a fermion. It's already... It's not, well, it's already in this one particle equation in a sense, but it's lift to the multiparticle theory tells you that. Okay? So you can imagine it took quite some while until people realized this because you can very easily get stuck. You try everything. You say, I did it right relativistically. Now I really try to find a probability inter interpretation of the Klein Gordon field or of the Dirac field and so on. And you bang your head against the wall because you didn't take the step back. Well, finally, of course, people did and say, what's the deep and simple reason for this failing? Okay, And so that's where maybe some physical intuition comes in. You say, well, particle number is not concerned, uh, conserved. But at first view, you seem to be doing everything right. right? But an implicit assumption that you describe one particle um, did not hold. Okay, And so today, the entire um, standard model of particle physics is made up of Dirac particles, like electrons and muons and so on. One Klein-Gordon field, one only, namely, what's the one Klein-Gordon field called that's in the standard model? It's the Higgs. The Higgs particle is a Klein-Gordon field. And so uh, the simplest of relativistic field equations, only very recently one has any indication that it's actually realized in, in reality. So far it was only a toy model. Well, if the Higgs is what people think it is. But the Dirac equation for electrons, so for all the spin one-half particles we have, and then we also have spin one particles. Those are the quantization and the lift to this of, um, well, in, um, yeah, essentially of Maxwell theory. So the theory, the, the electrodynamics, you know, in electronics you have an A mu field. If you write down the field equations, it's in terms of an A mu. Sometimes they're written in terms of E and B, uh, and that's equivalent to writing that in terms of F mu nu. But really the field is this here. It's a gauge theory in the field is that. Well, uh, the field equation for that, if you quantize it, it's even more difficult because it's a proper gauge theory, um, um, can also be lifted to something like this. It's again symmetrization, and the quantum particles of that are called photons. And then you start not looking at only these free equations, but you introduce interaction terms. And then in the Standard model, you get interaction terms, for instance, between electrons and positrons. Those are the, um, is the matter and antimatter coming from the Dirac equation, for instance. You, you start introducing interaction terms. You couple these equations together. And you all do this in a Lagrangian formalism. Uh, and then you get... Well, you can shoot, say, two electrons together. And then something happens due to the interaction terms, and the two electrons fly apart again. And uh, you want to calculate this. It's a very complicated calculation. And if the interaction you have is a weak, for instance, an electromagnetic interaction, which they have, what's the classical picture? Well, the classical picture is they repel each other because they're both electrons, right? Something happens, they repel. Why do I draw this straight? Because this means far away from the interaction area. area. They are again flat straight. Classically, you would say it's this, right? They do this because of the electromagnetic interaction. That's classical, classical explanation for what happens here. But in fact, the quantum explanation is more complicated, of course. 
And if the interaction is weak, what can you do? You can do perturbation theory of what happens at the interaction point. Okay? And then when you do perturbation theory, there is a very clever way to arrange the different orders of perturbations, higher and higher order perturbations, that contribute. And these higher orders, but this is only a perturbation expansion. It has no direct physical meaning. Although when I now draw the pictures, you will say, well, now I understand this. But <laughs> careful, it's only a perturbation expansion. Uh, but that's due to Feynman. He said, he saw that, for instance, for quantum electrodynamics, this is, there comes an electron, there comes another electron, and they actually exchange a photon and then an electron flies out and flies out. And this is not even the zeroth order, it's already the first order. The zeroth order is the electron here immediately does nothing. This one does nothing. That's the first order. Then comes the next, the zeroth order. Then comes the next order is a contribution like this. Then comes the next order is a contribution like this. Um, something like down here. Well, there are many to the next order. There could be a virtual electron-positron pair like this. It looks like that, chuck, 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 chuck. And so again, everything in here is just a perturbation expansion to what happens in here. And there are always these two in, two out, okay? Uh, and this goes on to higher orders. So it could then here look like, like this. So this is of the same order as this one. You see, um, this has one, two, three, four vertices. Every vertex is weighted with the electron charge. This is one, two, three, four. So these are fourth order contributions. There may be several. This is a second order contribution. This is a zeroth order contribution. This is an ex uh, a perturbation expansion. And Feynman, rather than understanding where this comes from, he wrote this down by intuition gave rules how to convert the diagrams in integrals to calculate the integrals, and the result is uh, a quantity, which is so-called S matrix, which you can interpret in terms of a scattering matrix to understand uh, what's going on there. Okay? And so it seems like two electrons interact by exchanging a photon, or by exchanging a photon that produces this anti or by exchanging two photons, and so on, this higher and higher order corrections. This makes so much sense because now all of a sudden the interaction, the messengers of interaction is no longer mysteriously like the, um, uh, there's an electron here, an electron there, and they repel each other by, by what? By an electric field? What's an electric field? What's happening here? It's actually relativistically moving particles. Although if I say this, particles here in these interior connections are so-called virtual particles. They can um, actually um, violate their normal energy momentum uh, relation and so on. It's a complicated business. However, these are so-called Feynman diagrams. And the Feynman diagrams are, the are a clever way to order the expansion terms of such interactions. And then the standard model is full of that. The other particles, the W and the Z bosons, um, for instance, uh, and the gluons, so W and Z is for the uh, weak force, and the, um, and the gluons are uh, for the quarks that hold the quarks together, so that's the strong force. All of these forces in the standard model uh, are modeled by, um, by vector fields. Okay? They are modeled by vector fields. So all the forces are modeled by vector fields. All the um, matter uh, that one usually talks about, like uh, uh, electrons, muons, and so on, are modeled by Dirac fields, and only the Higgs is modeled by a Klein-Gordon field. Why do we need the Higgs? Well, in principle, we would have to have, so only the electromagnetic force has infinite reach. Gravity is not in the picture. Only the electromagnetic force has infinite reach and ha can have a massless particle, namely the photon, making its interchange. Uh, the weak force and the strong force, they have very short reach, okay? And so the interaction particle would have to be massive. The problem is then you would have to write down a kind of a massive version of the Maxwell equations and quantize that. It would be the Proca equation. That doesn't work for various reasons. So Higgs had to invent the trick how you have an extra field which by spontaneous symmetry breaking as they call it 
gives the other fields effective mass. It's a very crazy idea. It's a very crazy idea, and it turns out to work. <laughs> okay. Um, so anyway, so this has to do with the, the standard model of particle physics. None of this would be possible without having this Fox space picture here. And you see here, this is happening all the time. You start with two particles, all of a sudden uh, you have four or five or six and, and so on, you, depending on how you arrange these diagrams. Okay? So in this interaction theory, you're always jumping between the different, different Hilbert spaces. Okay? So this is a very rough picture of what's happening there, and that's the full physics of matter as we understand it today, together with the forces. Hmm? And this is a relativistic picture, and this is deeply relativistic. So without relativity, it simply wouldn't look like that. Okay? But that's the, th that's the way our world is, is structured today, and, and how, how our theory of it looks like. Right? So you see what we discussed here, the one particle Hilbert space and its inner product, and maybe the tensor products and lifting inner products and all of that. This is the building block from which you can very quickly understand all the rest. Okay? So, but we, in, this, in these lectures, we only considered this one particle case, and it's only the beginning of the whole, of the whole picture. Okay? But all the hard work is done once you understood Hilbert spaces and inner products and so on. Okay? Uh, in this quantum field theory, um, it's very complicated because nice theorems that hold here no longer hold for the, the field theoretic case, especially um, representations. Um, so it, uh, in quantum field theory, there's much more ambiguity if you say, what's the most general thing I can write down and so on. This is not as simple, right? And um, so people tried in the, uh, well, mid middle of the last century, uh, they try to systematically understand quantum field theories and they say, well, let's put this on a proper axiomatic foundation like we have in quantum mechanics. And you get something called axiomatic quantum field theory. It's a very beautiful subject because it really takes all the assumptions and in mathematically rigorous form treats them. Uh, there are a number of rather interesting results uh, which are disastrous for everything that works because, um, for instance, in order to do these calculations, you need something called the interaction picture, uh, and you need it because you treat, need to treat these interactions. The problem is axiomatic quantum field theory tells you under these and those assumptions, which are all assumptions, you say, yes, of course, we need that. Uh, the interaction picture exists exactly if there are no interactions, uh, which is not particularly useful. So that means in quantum field theory, in the deep foundations of it, although all of this works, you have, to, you have to avoid looking too carefully. If you start looking as carefully as we looked at one particle quantum mechanics, the whole thing explodes. Okay? So, in a sense, there is not such a solid foundation of quantum field theory as there is of one particle quantum mechanics. Hence, in mathematical physics, not always, but many people concentrate on this case because that is a proper mathematical theory. As soon as you go to quantum field theory, all hell breaks loose. Okay? Uh, however, it's very likely that the situation is somewhat similar to, say, the Dirac distribution or so. It's just you need some new trick in looking at the mathematics. And many modern research directions in quantum field theory, or some at least, go in that direction. Okay? So you go to this next level, everything works out perfectly. So quantum field, so especially quantum field theory, and in particular quantum electrodynamics, is the best physical theory we have. Now, almost everybody nowadays uh, says that about their theory, um, but you can, if you count in terms of calculating um, things like the anomalous magnetic moment of, of the electron or something like this, quantum field theory, I think, does it to nine digits uh, uh, after the comma, and uh, this is unprecedented, okay? So quantum field theory really works extremely well, but if you look too closely at the rigor we did, it also gets, gets a little fuzzy. For instance, if you evolved in quantum field theory, if you evolved this up to order 137, <laughs> rather far, from then on, the precision of the result goes down again. So it's a serious 
that is actually perturbation series and it should get better and better and better you f the further you go, but from 137, nobody calculates up to there. Uh, this is already, a well, there's a little problem in, in a graduate course. If you go to two or three or four loops, it becomes a total expert subject. It's very difficult. So the more loops you have, the more intervals you have in there, and it becomes impossible to calculate. And higher loop order corrections is really to, to punish some, some graduate student. Um, but really, from a certain order onwards, it, it, you can't do it practically anymore. But you can show abstractly that from 137 or something, it gets worse again. Okay? Very strange stuff. Okay? So, so there's certainly something to be understood and, and, and so on. Uh, but what is done at CERN and, and elsewhere and what you use in astroparticle physics, oh, there's no gravity in the picture yet. This is the picture if you do this on actually on flat space-time. If you go to curved space-time, uh, even the particle concept saying you have one, the quantum state is interpreted as one particle or two particles, even that gets fuzzy. You have funny things like the so-called Unruh effect, where if you fly, say, even through flat space-time, uh, you go with your detector through a vacuum. So, so you say you have a state where all of this is zero and there's only a one from here. You go through vacuum in a vacuum with a detector on a spaceship without a rocket. You just go through space. You detect nothing because there is no particle. Now, there's somebody who goes acceleratedly, say a constant acceleration, that's in space times a hyperbola, at constant acceleration, and um, he also has the same detector with him. You measure no particles. He will not only measure one or two or three particles, he will measure any particle number at an energy distribution that's a thermal distribution. So he will feel hot, so many particles around at so many different energies. So if you're an accelerated observer, according to quantum field theory, the notion of there is a particle or there isn't depends on whether on your state of motion. All inertial observers agree how many particles there are, but as soon as you accelerate it, who it gets tricky. Okay. Ultimately, such effects also lead to uh, if you're at a black hole, so now we're getting really into the thick of it. The black hole, you know, things can only fall into the black hole but cannot go out because of the uh, uh, cones. And very roughly speaking, however, you can have a process where um, you have a virtual, you have kind of nothing, and all of a sudden you would have the creation and the immediate annihilation of, say, an electron, okay? Uh, that's called a vacuum bubble. There's nothing, then for a short while there is something, and then it annihilates as nothing. There are more, more interesting vacuum bubbles. Now, this one doesn't exist. Um, this is another interesting vacuum bubble. Thankfully, if you calculate this stuff, there are lots of vacuum bubbles everywhere accompanying this, uh, but they all cancel against each other. That's great. That's why this works. Okay, anyway, I don't think. Uh, if you're now near the black hole, you have this, and it's, it's not only an intuitive explanation, there's a better calculation. One can go in and can never come out, and if this one is somehow pulled away, I mean, in reality, nothing happens. There's nothing coming out of the black hole, but very roughly speaking, it's a very rough picture, you see that something's coming from a black hole, and that's Hawking radiation. Okay? But this can be calculated properly. So kind of all these nice, well, nice or famous things like radiation of black holes and the Unruh effect and all of that, it's just pushing this to the point where you also do it on curved space-time. And then you have all these, these combined effects. But in all of this, what we did in this course, the one particle quantum mechanics, is an elementary building block. The only thing that changes is that you start asking how to interpret it. And you lift the equations to the, to the entire Fox space. Okay? So there are uh, lectures on this. Uh, uh, well, quantum field theory would be one lecture that does that. But also in modern cosmology, you would have to consider such stuff. So that is why you actually should uh, attend that course maybe after quantum field theory course. And inevitably, it mixes with general relativity at some point. Okay. So, so this is then the, the modern picture of where, where this all leads, and, and that's where modern research takes place. And there are many open questions, many open questions. However, there are also dramatic successes. For instance, if space-time expands, which it does, well, there's a big bang, not because we postulate it, but because if you calculate back with the Einstein equation, there must have been one. The big thing, the space-time expands, and out of a vacuum, out of having no particle, 
you all of a sudden get particles and it depends on how the space-time expands. And you can calculate how much, what is it, uh, 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 hydrogen and helium or whatnot um, is produced this way. And you get a proportion from the evolution of the universe as we know it from general relativity that is precisely the proportion, some 60, 40 of one against the other, that is then when it burns in stars, which we know rather well how that works, gives the heavier elements and the resulting abundance of elements that we see in the universe by spectro spectroscopy and so on rather coincides with this whole picture. So by starting in a vacuum and by an expanding space-time thereby having particles produced, I mean, it's crazy that it fits together that well, we even understand where this table is coming from. Even if at the Big Bang there was no matter at all, the universe expands and by using a structure like this one, it gets a little more complicated, but not much. This is essentially right, what I'm telling you. I mean, nothing can be right that I tell in, in, in one hour in a subject that's not totally clarified. But, um, okay, this table is essentially there according to the modern picture of cosmology, which is n no invention other than general relativity and quantum field theory on that curved background, uh, is generated from absolutely nothing. Okay, this is the vacuum in the beginning, but it becomes today the non-vacuum in our interpretation. There are periods of the evolution of the universe where you can't even say there's a particle or not because what is missing is a so-called time-like killing vector field of those of you who know that, because only, only that allows you to get, identify a Hamiltonian and thereby particles and so on and so on and so on and so on. So there are many, many uh, things, but it's, uh, it's essentially this picture, okay? So we have a rather comprehensive picture of many, many questions that before any, before general relativity and quantum field theory, you didn't even dare asking where does matter, matter come from? Did, did God put it there or was it always there? Or if the universe started in the Big Bang, was all the matter already there and it now just reformed and so on? No, no, the matter itself was generated from the vacuum. It's not a postulate, it's a conclusion. So if any of this is, is right and it, seems to be right in, in, many, in many ways, uh, then we have uh, fantastic answers of this type. Not only where space and time come from, well, it's the Big Bang. You can say it's a non-explanation, it's just a, a diagnosis that there must have been an event like that, or not an event, anyway. So uh, GR predicts that, um, uh, but also where the matter comes from. Mm -hmm. And in all of that, all these questions, what's an inner product, what's the probability, what's the Hilbert space, and so on, all of that plays a role. And uh, really what we did and the precision to what we did it um, becomes particularly important once you go to the, to the Fox space. Yeah? Questions of convergence and all of these things, right? So actually the way I presented it today with the Schrodinger equation, how you get it from the energy momentum and, and then you get the probability interpretation, that looks also light and so oh, why didn't you start the course with that? It would have been so much more blah, blah, blah. But the point is at the end of the day, this is an approach that quickly runs against the wall because uh, you're not prepared to go the next few steps, right? And um, so these, these are the next few steps. I think uh, uh, we stop it here. We have another problem class on Thursday. Uh, then during the um, term break, you'll get uh, another problem sheet from me to test yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and then as we agreed last week of the term break, there will be the exam. Thank you. Mm -hmm.